All right, going live in three, two, one. Good evening, Farley High School uh, PTA. Uh, tonight is our Ruler presentation. Um, Ruler is a social emotional learning, an evidence based social lear emotional learning program that we implemented in uh, September with the uh, hopes of addressing some of the things that we knew we would be hit with at the beginning of the school year. Um, we, we, we went through training, the building administrators who went through training in the spring uh, during the pandemic uh, for this program from the Yale University of Emotional Intelligence. Uh, the, the work is based on the book Permission to Feel by Mark Brackett, who did speak here at Farmingdale High School at Farmingdale Schools um, during Superintendent's Conference Day. He gave a keynote um, address. So what you'll see tonight is an overview of how parents and families at home can work with their children on some of the uh, ruler social emotional learning skills that we'll talk about here tonight. And uh, without getting too far ahead, I, of course, am Dr. Thompson. I'm the proud principal of Farmingdale High School. I'm joined tonight by my two building administrative colleagues, Mrs. Arlene Martinez and Mr. Jed Herman, and you'll hear from both of them over the course of the presentation. And we are really happy to partner with our PTA because that's how we're going to best support all of our students. So, as I mentioned, RULER. What is RULER? What's it even stand for? What does it mean? Um, how are families involved in this presentation? And this quote up here sums it all up. Uh, we are inspiring families to learn about and develop social emotional skills as a powerful way to have long-term impact on the lives of children and adolescents. So I mentioned that this will help support all students in their progress and achievement. What it best does, and, and what I can sum up in a nutshell, is it teaches you how to self-regulate emotion. Oftentimes, if you're going through a lot of uh, distressing things or something that may be caused trauma or crisis, you tend to um, project that. You tend to either bottle it up, which, which is worse inside, or you project it. And if you are projecting that way, then uh, it's going to be hard for the person who is receiving that emotion. So what Ruler does is it gives you a set of skills to self-regulate your emotion. And it also helps if someone is coming at you at a 10. So it's good for students, it's good for adults. All of our faculty and staff will have been trained. And we went on a process this year to uh, offer professional development to everyone in the Farmville High School community to be sure they were familiar with this terminology. Ultimately, and, and, and towards the end going forward, uh, it sounds as if we're going to be doing this um, district-wide. So there is a plan that's being drafted to uh, address all of our buildings, which would really be the full gamut, because then students would be reflexive in how they express what they're dealing with or what they're going through by the time they get to later years in schooling. So tonight's agenda, we're going to give you an overview and an introduction on the five ruler skills. We're going to talk about the four anchor tools because those are embedded strategies in this process uh, and they include the charter, the mood meter, the meta moment, and the blueprint. You may already have seen mood meters posted around the building if you've been in our school this year um, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the mood meter. There'll be uh, students will be exposed through examples and lesson plans, group activities, and collaboration on the charter, which is one of the anchor tools that I'll talk um, in depth about through the presentation. So we're also going to have um, an implementation timeline, implementation timeline that we'll talk about for year one and year two. So this is really about a three to four year implementation. We're going to talk about where we are right now in year one. We're going to talk about where we plan to start year two, which is likely October um, next school year. And then we'll be continuing to plan um, for further steps as we go into year three and four. But really important tonight is engaging the school community in what all of this means and uh, then hopefully opening up a charter activity that I'll talk about to all of the Farmingdale High School community. So we had some outcomes this year. And this work started last year with our um, leadership team uh, exploring the book Permission to Feel by Mark Back Brackett, which is the backbone to all of this. Um, students were also invited to conduct and, and participate in that professional read 
because we were dealing with students who had been, uh, in higher numbers, experiencing anxiety. We were looking for strategies to help kids address and um, cope with what they were dealing with through the pandemic. So high levels of anxiety, high levels of depression, um, stress, and uh, students who had experienced trauma, maybe loss from um, the pandemic, from COVID. So we knew that we would be kids who were in isolation, right? We knew that through virtual um, uh, teaching and learning that kids had not been interacting socially in a while. So uh, we started our training, as I said, uh, and we did this in part with the professional read as a group with uh, permission to feel. And then those professionals that are on the leadership team, it's made up of a heterogeneous group of educators in the building, uh, invited some students to some meetings to talk about how we could, or if we should, implement ruler in our school, and those students said, please do. Part of that had to do with what they experienced in school, and what better way to get a, a perspective on what schools or what students are experiencing in schools than to ask them, than to invite them, to engage them in this kind of exploration, because that's where we were at first. Once we had their input, and we realized the impact that this could have for most students, one of the things that they said is, it might be good if you have this one particular teacher on your schedule where they help you cope with certain things, but if you don't, you're really on your own. And that was really profound to us. We really heard that loud and clear. So this year we um, started to implement Ruler after the training uh, last spring. We also held a collegial circle this summer. Again, a group of educators that start to um, draft a curriculum that we could turnkey with all the other staff members in the building and put together a way to see this through for three or four years. And that's really where we are. We're in year one of the implementation for Ruler. We're going to identify Ruler skills to, for all the faculty and staff by providing an overview. We're going to do the same for you guys tonight. Um, some of the things that kids have been involved in and what teachers were learning was to uh, conduct mood meter exercises in classes to develop being an emotion scientist, how to apply the five skills and begin the exploration of the anchor tools. By the end of this school year, we hope to conduct a charter activity, which is sort of like a mission statement. You assign some uh, adjectives that describe or emotions that describe what would be ideal to feel coming to school. So hopefully they're all positive words, and then you talk about what actions might be ones you would take to make sure that that happens. So let's say you chose welcome, you want to feel included um, and, and happy or welcome in school. So then what would you do to ensure uh, that emotion? Well, maybe greeting people when you come to school, just saying hello and being friendly might be a way that you feel welcome. So we'll talk about that charter activity. The mood meter that I mentioned is a chart, um, a scale of sorts going from pleasantness on along one axis and energy on the other. And if you're up in the red, it could be high energy, but if you're low in pleasantness and high energy, you're using emotions that are like angry and tense and frustrated in that area. You still got a lot of energy, but you're not in a pleasant place. If you move over to the bottom left, low energy, still unpleasant, sort of blue, and that's why that, that color is there. Um, it represents like lonely and discouraged and glum, hopeless. That's kind of where those two are on the mood meter when you talk about how you're feeling. And then there are a hundred emotions described on the meter to use or for kids to decide because the hardest thing when you talk to a high schooler about their day at school is good. And oftentimes you get those one word responses about how is school today? Good. And there are so many different ways that they should be or could be expressing their emotions. And these mood meters help them get a sense for other ways that they can describe their emotions. And when you apply this in the classroom, some teachers will ask them to talk about where they are this morning on the mood meter or today on the mood meter. Where are you guys? Somebody who came from lunch might be um, in the green area or in the yellow area. Yellow is high energy and pleasant. So I always give the analogy of like the kindergarten teacher. All the time, high energy, pleasant, smiles on your face and, and greeting these little guys. That's kind of where you are if you're, if you're uh, in the yellow zone. 
And words used to describe that are happy, focused, enthusiastic, motivated, festive. Um, and, it, and it also equates to classroom activity when kids are thinking and learning. So that's a good place to be. And so is the green, a really good place to be for, the, for learning. It's a little lower energy, so maybe you're thinking more. Maybe you're uh, more thoughtful and processing things. But you're in a pleasant place. So a really good place for group activity is the green. And, there, and in that zone, uses words like peaceful, thoughtful, easygoing, content. So again, there are a um, hundred ways, 25 in each of these quadrants that people can describe their emotion. And it's important that kids get a sense for different things. Not everything is, is um, mad, I'm, I'm mad about everything. There are a number of ways you can use to describe mad, a number of ways you can use to describe that you're happy. So we do different exercises to get these, um, to get kids in the process of thinking about how they're feeling and expressing how they're feeling. And this is one of the ways, we're not gonna do this through this type of um, virtual presentation and, and live presentation, but what I have done in the past with our professional development is provided this link or this text. You would text in and you would get to complete a Wordle, which is one of those, um, big screens with all the different adjectives that folks have sent in displayed on the screen. And the one that's most prominent, or that most people are choosing, shows up in the biggest letters. So I don't know that you've seen these before, um, but that was one of the activities that we used, using the mood meter to say, submit your emotion today and let, just let us know how you're feeling. That is the best question to ask um, when you're talking about the mood meter and you're asking somebody, the other thing that we learned through this practice is a lot of times we ask people how they're doing, but we really don't listen. So how you're feeling really engages you to first think about your own emotion and also if you're asking, listen to what the person has to say. So I often greet people and, and don't pause or don't take enough time. You just, hey, how are we doing? How are we, hey, how are you doing? And that's it. You move on. You're not really engaging or, or um, concerned um, genuinely about how somebody's feeling. And then we turn the corner to how the mood meter has been presented in the classroom this year. So these are different images that uh, display what people have done. In one in the middle here, there was a uh, business classroom where kids came in on chart paper, as simple as chart paper and are posted. They wrote their emotion on the post-it, they posted it on the chart paper in the four quadrants, whether it was yellow, red, blue, or green, and off they went. On the left, you can see how that's used on an electronic whiteboard. And then on the right is something that was created in dual language and visuals, so it's in English and Spanish, and visuals to demonstrate the emotions in the four quadrants. And this was created in our library and is posted in the library, and a lot of the teachers asked to have this um, for their classroom. So right away, folks hit the ground running with what activities and lessons they were doing with the mood meter. I'm going to give you a brief overview of um, Ruler as described um, from an expose that was um, presented on CBS. So hold on while I press um, play for this. In our special series, School Matters, as parents work to keep their kids' education on track, many are also focusing on their children's mental health. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that since the start of the pandemic in March, 14% of parents reported worsening behavioral health for their kids. Across the country, 73% of school districts offer social and emotional learning programs, which have now been linked to improved behavior, relationships, and your grades too. Dr. Taryn Ruler reports those programs may be needed now more than ever. Take a deep breath. Jim Home starts every school day with a mantra. May I be happy. Along with reading, writing, and math, Jet is learning about feelings. It's all part of something called Ruler, a curriculum used at 2,500 schools around the country. All of us in the are attending on the Mark Brackett developed the program at Yale University. The emotions matter for everything. If we can't manage our feelings, it's hard to be creative, um, and it's hard to focus. In his book, Permission to Feel, Brackett outlines five steps for mastering emotions. Recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, regulating. Emotions are a lot more complex than just being like, oh, like I'm happy right now, or I'm sad. The hardest part is recognizing how you feel. 
Ruler uses a color-coded tool to help students identify their feelings. We ask students from New York's lab school to show us how it works. When I'm feeling red, I feel like an intense anger and frustration. When I'm feeling yellow, I feel super happy and super energized. Blue, sad, and overwhelmed. Green, tranquil, and relaxed. I do a world by Lake St. Louis. Because of the pandemic, Leslie Gill and her sister Lauren aren't able to practice the ruler concepts as they usually do with their classmates. You have to write about how you think the other person feels, so then you see the different perspectives, because you might be thinking that this person feels one way, but it's actually they feel like the opposite. It's very important for us to not assume how kids are feeling. We do that all the time. And what research shows is that we often make a lot of mistakes. Why is social emotional learning so critical, particularly when we're living through a pandemic? We're feeling the strongest emotions we might have ever had before. My research with children shows that they're frustrated, they're overwhelmed, they're anxious, they're bored, they're lonely. Me and my brother will fight a lot. Um, especially during quarantine. Stepping back and like thinking about what I'm saying and how I'm feeling has definitely helped me. I've been like struggling, I've been like stressed out. We're in a global pandemic, you don't have to like be like perfect. Parents are also offered ruler training to reinforce what their children learn at school. First day out in over a month. It's helping Jet and his family navigate the pandemic together. As a male, I was kind of raised to not be emotional. These kids are being introduced at, at a young age and they're, they're able to define their feelings and their emotions. And it took me years of therapy to be able to say that. What do you think parents could do a better job at in terms of talking to their kids about their emotions? The best way to make teenagers feel comfortable opening up about their emotions is if you guys do the same. So I hope parents know that they can be vulnerable too. We, as parents, don't have to have all the answers. We just have to be compassionate. We have to ask the questions and guide our children. Dr. Tara Narula Jones says, now Tara, this is such a great idea. I love what Jet's parents said. So many people are raised not to express their emotions. So. What can parents do? Isn't it hard for them to sometimes know if their kids are struggling and what can they do about that? Absolutely, Gail, and it's so important. And we spoke to Dr. Brackett about that, who you saw in the piece, and there are a couple things he recommended. The first is really being a role model for your kids, that even when you think they're not listening and watching you, they are. They're seeing how you react to your anxieties, your stresses, your fears, and your mistakes. So you can be vulnerable, but you can also teach them strategies that are healthy to deal with their feelings. The second is, as he said, don't assume what your child is feeling. Behavior does not equal emotion. So just because your child looks calm doesn't mean they may be feeling that way. Just because your child storms out of the room and says, I hate you, mom, it may be that they're not really angry. Maybe they're disappointed at a failure that happened at school. Maybe they had a fight with their friend. So really important to sit down, talk to your kid, ask them how they're feeling, and listen to what they have to say. So important. Thank you, Tara. You can easily train yourself to listen faster. So that kind of really resonated with me personally, and I tell a story all the time. Even with my own son, I would tell him to suck it up. You know, I would tell my son, what are you crying for? Can you stop crying? This is silly. This, you, this is not a crying moment. And I was really defining for him when he should feel sad or express himself through crying. So it hit home for me a little bit, and I think growing up, I was told to suck it up and uh, not show too much emotion, so I didn't do that too much. What this is showing is that if we just listen as parents and we allow kids to express what their emotion is or talk more um, and we demonstrate that compassion by listening and offering some suggestions, we don't have to have all the answers as you heard. Um, New York State actually laid out some benchmarks uh, in the State Ed Department, a framework for mental health instruction and some SEL benchmarks. 
has to do with kids being able to manage, self-manage, and develop their own self-awareness and self-management skills, has to do with relationships and how they interact with other people in a positive way or maintain positive relationships, and it has to do with managing resources. Who do I go to when I'm in a, in a crisis? And um, how am I responsible for my behaviors at school? Um, so those three things are part of the New York State framework for SEL. So the rule of focus, and you heard the um, five ruler skills, um, recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and, and regulating your emotion. This is about creating a calm language around emotions and the skill development for emotional intelligence in general. And with a school-wide implementation, you're going to have less kids who say, I felt isolated, or I didn't know who to go to, or I didn't know how to talk about my emotion. If they're getting something across all areas, in a broad way, um, people are equipped to talk or for them to express themselves and not have things be pent up, and for teachers to start to recognize that it's not necessarily the kid is mad or angry or frustrated, as you heard, but can also start to recognize emotions in a better way. Because then you can actually make the right recommendation on how, how the child can deal with it. Um, we talked about these five skills, so I'm not going to go too far, but I'll help you define it. Um, recognizing emotions in yourself and others, understanding the consequences and causes of the emotions, labeling them um, with that nuanced vocabulary and mood meter, expressing emotions in accordance with um, norms in general, cult cultural and social, and then regulating. Um, what strategies do I do to keep all of this in check? Using it in school is key. Uh, it helps increase emotional intelligence. It's probably the best one. Keeps kids in a good place for academic performance. Um, less likely to bully other students when you're able to recognize how a kid's feeling from what you're saying or doing. Um, and of course, better leadership skills and attention. But teachers in general will have better rapport with kids when they're able to recognize what emotions are coming at them. And kids will have better time uh, expressing and regulating their emotion. That's the goal. That's the goal. Um, and eventually getting these into day-to-day -day lessons. Not every day, not every week in many cases, but um, for kids to just get in a practice of talking about how they're feeling is going to help them regulate their emotions better. So we'll talk about this with the charter. Um, again, a perfect quote for why we would do this in school and how we're going to get there in a community sense when everybody is interacting in a very positive way for the purpose of uh, making sure your school is reaching this mission or this charter uh, for positive reasons or a personally positive approach to school. And we're in phase one. I talked about uh, this being the um, first year one implementation of it and um, it started with our leadership team and I described that in the beginning of the presentation and what steps we are going to take over the next year and a half two years to implement Ruler uh, school-wide. And kids on our leadership team meeting talk to us about where they'd like to see this take place. Some cases, homeroom. Some cases, a, me a meditation center, perhaps in the library. That has not been created or implemented yet, but we were looking for areas where kids could go and practice that if they chose to. Health class could certainly have discussions or talk about strategies for kids to regulate their emotion. Fit for life class, which is part of the ninth grade phys ed curriculum, um, or maybe even the 10, 12 phys ed classes. English, where every kid has an English class on their schedule, or social studies, where everyone has social studies. But we mentioned English because it really does tie into some of the themes that you'll see or read about in literature when you're talking about emotion. So this is really the timeline of all the things that we've done at this point as part of the implementation. There was a faculty presentation in June uh, of 21. There was a ruler coach from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence that worked with us. Uh, we had a summer collegial circle. We had an opening faculty meeting in September. Uh, we had a professional read of Permission to Feel by Mark Brackett. We did turnkey work and training with the district administrators. So Mrs. Martinez, Mr. Herman, and myself have held a monthly PD for all staff. Whoever wants to come, um, comes up to uh, their professional development and we've held one of those a month since September. We um, had Mark Brackett here uh, for professional development keynote on Superintendent's Conference Day. Uh, we did a five-hour professional development strand for all faculty that they can sign up on their own. It's really self-directed if they choose. They can sign up for Ruler for um, a faculty professional development strand, and that takes you over um, five hours in, in several sessions. 
And then we're beginning family engagement. We're, we're at this point at the bottom here, spring 2022, where we start to reach out and offer an overview and an introduction this year for parents and families. And eventually it gets more and more involved for what you can do where you're, where you're actually having conversations or, or students are bringing home um, some talking points, some topics to discuss with your family, your parents, your siblings, um, whoever's at home. And then we'll schedule more in-service courses and have ongoing opportunities to model these strategies among all our clubs, our groups, our, our organizations in the school community. So at this point in the presentation, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Herman, who's going to talk to you about the first anchor tool. There are four total, and this is the mood meter. Mr. Herman. Thank you, sir. Hello, everybody. Appreciate that. So how are we feeling? <laughs> Wonderful, great. Okay, good. So take out your pens. It's time for homework. How are you feeling now? <laughs> so the mood meter is one of the tools that we use when we talk about mood. And really the point of it is to give students um, the opportunity to, to place where they're feeling on a chart. Many times, as Dr. Thomas said, we ask kids if they're feeling fine, good, bad, hungry. I get that a lot. But they don't really understand how their emotions impact their day-to-day, -day, right? They're learning. So having the mood meter allows people to plot on a chart how they're feeling so that you can see how everyone's doing. So as a teacher, right? Come in the class, how's everyone feeling today? Put up on the mood meter. And when you have that information, it will lend itself to the creation or how your lesson goes. For example, we know that when we ask kids for group work in the morning, it looks very different than when we ask kids for group work in the afternoon because our kids are feeling a different way. You know very often as parents that if you ask your kids to clean their room early in the morning, you get a very different response than when you say clean your room late at night because their emotions impact their behavior. So as Dr. Thompson talked about real quick, those, those are the four different quadrants, right? High energy and high pleasantness, and then it moves from left to right, okay? So here's why it's important. It helps you become aware of your emotions and then how emotions can impact your actions. One of the things that I've learned while we've talked about this mood meter and about Ruler over the last year is that we really have to get out of the habit of labeling emotions good and bad. There really are no bad emotions. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't the different opportunities for when you can express that emotion, because not every emotion is acceptable at all times. I couldn't come in here with low energy and start talking like this, because the presentation would look a lot different. But it's to understand, hey, maybe there's something going on with that person. Maybe there's something that I don't know about, and maybe they're going through something. Maybe I need to check in with them, right? When someone comes home from work and you ask them how their day was, right? Very often, we know based on their mood, how they come in the door, what that interaction is going to go, what it's going to look like. It doesn't mean that we say, oh, you need to fix yourself before you come in the room. Obviously, something happened that day, and that's how you're feeling. So we have to be able to understand those things, right? So we, we have to be able to express the way we're feeling. And then we have to figure out what's a, a good way to regulate it. So this is all based on research. Nothing we do is based on um, anything other than data and research. So here are some schol scholarly articles. I know that, that all the viewers at home, you can access them, but they will be available in the presentation. There are scholarly articles about why emotions matter and how it impacts education, really how it impacts learning. But as parents, there's other things that we know, right? We know that how our emotions are impacts how we speak to our children. When we have a bad day at work, I've never had one of those, but I've heard, when you have a bad day at work, it can impact how we talk to our children, right? Sometimes we're short with our kids or our families because of things that have nothing to do with them. There are some days where my kids will say, Dad, I'm hungry, I want a snack. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. There are other days I'm like, ugh. My kids didn't change what they asked for. They literally asked for the same thing. I'm the one that changed because my mood has impacted that interaction. And that's why it matters. Again, how was your day? There are some days where I'll come home and my kids will say, fine. And there are other days where I'll press them because fine isn't good enough. I want to know a little bit more about your day. But again, that's me wanting to know more. Maybe that's all they're able to give me in that moment, and that's okay. The mood meter also allows you to pick a word when there are times when you can't 
put your finger on exactly how you're feeling. Especially with kids. They may not be able to express exactly how they're feeling in that moment, but I guarantee they can tell you in what quadrant they are. So the mood meter allows kids to use a frame of reference to help them tell you, you know, mom, I'm feeling disheartened. I don't think my kids know what that word means. But when they show you where it is on the mood meter, you go, all right, I, I understand, you know? And I understand now why you're acting the way you are. Or I'm feeling really hopeful or focused, content, tranquil. The mood meter allows you to see examples when you may not be able to express exactly how you're feeling with words. It gives kids those words they may not have. Now this doesn't work at all levels. Some of you at home with younger kids, we don't expect you to have a mood meter that looks like this. And the mood meter changes based on age. So if you have younger kids, it's much more condensed. There's a lot less words. But again, it gives kids the opportunity to show you a model of how they're feeling. We use it in the classroom, right? There's a mood meter app you can use. So again, it's just research for teachers. Maybe there's something going on that day and, and the teacher's unaware because they've been up in their classroom in the corner of the building teaching for the last three, three hours and they don't understand that something went on with kids and they're feeling really upset, right? And this is what it kind of looks like at the younger levels. See how um, there's ways that you can do it where you can have a word bank and kids can select the word and put it on. Or each kid can take their name and put it on the board. So there's different ways you can use the mood meter depending on the level of the kid, the level of your household, right? Because the goal really is to incorporate this in your house. And it's simple. How are you feeling? Think about how powerful that is. If you actually asked that question and waited and cared, how are you feeling? So that's the mood meter. It's really just a tool to be able to have kids express their emotions or put a label on their emotions. And please, remember, there really are no bad emotions. We have to get out of labeling that because um, all emotions matter. That's the point of the mood meter, and that's the point of ruler. And thank you for your time. I will now pass it over to my colleague, Mrs. Martinez. Thanks, expect a louder applause when I'm done. Just saying, okay. Good evening, everyone, and good evening to our folks at home. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the meta moment right now, and and I talk about the meta moment when I when I mean when I say meta moments, I I really want you guys to talk think about going to a place where you actually stop, pause, and reflect on what's happening. So going meta requires self awareness and understanding, and it's it's obviously the psychological term for metacognition, right? So, when you needed to take a moment, but you didn't. I don't know if you guys have ever been part of something where something upset you and you just said something you should not have said or reacted in a way where you said, hmm, I could have handled that better. So, some of the things that happen is that we get triggered by something. And we have to recognize our trigger in order to be, to be able to really reflect and think about how we should respond. Sometimes triggers could be when you're merging onto the highway and you almost get hit by another car. That's actually my trigger. I'm not the best driver. Don't ask Jed because he'll tell you stories about my driving. But, um, you know, it's a trigger for me. I, I, I get nervous because I'm not a great driver. And it really makes me upset when people are driving super fast and then they almost hit me when they're merging onto the highway. Crying children. I've done a, a, a survey when we've been, um, we, I think Dr. Thompson already explained that we, we've done a few different um, runnings of this with the faculty and stuff. And so when, when I do an informal survey of this, when we have men and women in the room, a lot of men, this is their trigger, crying children. They feel like they have to do something. I'm okay with the crying child, just let them cry, but usually, you know, men get triggered by it. Snarky teenagers, we don't know about snarky teenagers because we don't have any, so we wouldn't know that, but that can be a trigger for some people. I've heard, anyway. Seeing an injustice take place, that triggers a lot of people. Anybody that's a part of my Libra friends, you know, if you, if you want to see equal equality and balance, it bothers you when you see something that is in, unjust, 
a lot of people are triggered by seeing an injustice take place. And so we have to recognize that you become triggered because an emotional need was not met or it was suddenly taken away. And that's why you become triggered. And so sometimes we react in a way that we shouldn't react because of this. So this is what the meta moment is. So you sense that there's a change happening within your body. You know when, when this happens, when you get upset. Some of us feel it physically. We feel it maybe we get flushed in the face or we feel our body tensing up. So you sense what's happening. You pause and you wait to respond. You breathe a few times. You see your best self and then you strategize and you act. And sometimes that strategy could be that you're not going to say anything at all, that you won't respond at that moment. So here's a quick scenario. I'm going to read it to you guys. Um, we we catered this. I catered this for you guys, but uh, we do something a little bit different with the faculty. So your teenager has suddenly. So picture your babies. Your teenager has suddenly exhibited behaviors that you haven't seen before. Your baby has suddenly become dismissive of their everyday responsibilities at at home and have become angry and sullen when asked to do something. The social studies called home. Social studies teacher called home. Here he is, Mr. Hughes. He called home and said, "Your child has stopped handing in work and now puts his or her head down during class and has become avoidant. When you address the situation with your child, your teen gets angry with you and tells you to leave him or her alone. That weekend, you're woken up at 3 a.m. by a loud knock on the door. Your child was brought home by the police. Apparently, there was a loud party and the police were called because a local neighbor called the precinct." to report that there was underage drinking taking place at the party. You had no idea that your child left the house to go to a party. So, could you imagine that? So what's your first honest reaction look like and sound like to that scenario that was just presented? Think about that for a second. What, was your, what, would you, what is happening in your body right now if you're thinking about your child and something like that happens? Would you respond in a, in an anger or a tone that is, with a, in a tone that's angry? Would you respond in a calm tone? How would you react to that? Think about that. Oh, I know how I would react, but I'm not allowed to say those words out here. So. Okay, so here's the full story, right? So think about this. Your child has been friends with the same group since fifth grade. Your child's regular friend group had an argument. Everyone is angry at everyone and they stop communicating in school as well as social media, which you know social media is really the one that's really bothering the kids, right? So your teen is extremely sad about the breakup of the friend group and doesn't want to talk to, about it to anyone. This has caused your child to not want to do anything at home. And since some of the friends are in his or her social studies class, the child does not want to be part of any of the class activities and prefers to avoid the situation. Your teen snuck out to a go to a party that you wouldn't approve of in order to try to fit in with another friend group. So how would a meta moment have helped both you and your child in this scenario? So think about that for one second. Now, if you had known this information previously, perhaps you wouldn't have responded in anger, or perhaps you would have, right? Because this, it, it was egregious. You, you snuck out of my house, the police brought you home, you're not doing your work, you're not helping me at home, you're now, it's just a shift. But if you stop, to think about what was actually happening. Perhaps there could have been a little bit of a different response or some empathy that you would be able to have been able to, I'm seeing some, <laughs> some shaking of heads, uh, that you would have been able to respond differently, right? <laughs> so imagine being your best self. What happens if in a moment where you had the opportunity to stop and think and reflect about what the, your response should be. What would that look like and sound like if you were your best self in that moment? To me, best self means being the best person I can be, the person I aspire to be, the person that I, I would admire if I met that person for the first time. My best self is the person that I want to be known as to other people. It's the guide that I have for my own behavior. When I think of my best self, I think of the person that I would be proud of. It's kind of like a goal. What's my best self today? What am I going to get done today? What am I going to accomplish? 
I would say my best self is a creative person and a connected person and a mindful person. I would say my best self is brave, inspired, and a good listener. Patient, um, committed, and honorable. Focused, energetic, and hard. Well, I'm my best self. I am smiling, my face is lit up. I'm probably more attractive than I am on any other day. I see a person who is able to be a good example for people around. My best self looks like someone who is confident, sure of what I need to get done, and ready to face the day and everything that holds. No matter what role you're in, your best uh, self could mean a lot of different things. I think it is kind of situational. Like my best self when I'm at work might be, let me not fall on my face today. And then my best self at home would be, okay, let me keep everything from falling apart. For my children, it's really about being uh, supportive and about being encouraging and being loving to them. So when I walk out and I project my best self, I'm open, I'm smiling, I'm relaxed, I'm confident, I might um, have a little pep in my step. I'm somebody that is inviting others in. I'm saying hi to people on the street, I'm making eye contact, really just engaging with the world around me. You need to have the courage to be able to look in the mirror and see yourself and understand that you have the potential to be your best self for the day. And you could be one version of yourself that gets the job done, that goes from A to B by walking. But to be able to look in the mirror in the morning and say, I'm going to find a way to fly today, that's being my best self. To me. Okay, so I gave you worst case scenario. And I said, how would you react if you took a meta moment? So if you thought about the scenario that I gave you and you did these strategies, you paused, you took slow, deliberate breaths in order to relax your body, reframe the situation and consider the perspective of the other person because there is a different perspective. You feel one way and the other person always is going to have their own side and their own feelings. So if you were able to do this, and then use positive self-talk, which is what we, we talk to the students about, our children here, and say, I'm not gonna lose my cool over this, then, then imagine your best self. So these are the motive, meta moment strategies that we share out with the students. Something happens, you're triggered by something, you sense what's happening within your body, you stop, you see your best self, you strategize, and you succeed. Okay, and again, sometimes this, this strategy may be saying nothing at the moment, right? So at that time, if you think of the worst case scenario that I gave you, maybe the strategy would be, it's 3 a.m., I'm really angry, and right now, we both need to go to bed, or we both need to walk away, and we'll talk about this at a different time. And that is a strategy. So this is what we share with the students, um, and this is when we ask them to take a moment or a meta moment, this is what we ask them to do. Stop, sense, reflect, think about how you want to react, and then choose a strategy. Here we go. Thank you, Mrs. Martinez. So we talked about three of the anchor tools, and there's one left, it's called the blueprint. And the blueprint really has to do with resolving uh, some type of conflict, sort of restorative and restoring some uh, environment that you've impacted through your behavior, perhaps, through your emotion. Um, the term going postal, right? If you lost it somewhere, you have to restore that environment that you damaged through your emotion. And that's what the blueprint has to go through. Um, it has to deal with going through and understanding someone else's perspective and talking about how you would treat this situation differently if you had the chance to do over. And it works really well with both adults and kids. So um, a useful tool in conflict resolution, something we've started to use in Prepare, um, where, where we have an opportunity to sit with kids and talk about how they affected a particular community through their behavior. There are descriptions about different conflicts that you'll be in and how you may respond in those um, scenarios, whether they are competitive, avoiding, accommodating, collaborative, or compromising, and, and there are definitions for each of those and examples for each of those for kids to contemplate, to think about. 
And then there is a script of sorts for them to understand their perspective. How did you feel? What caused these feelings? What did you express to regulate your feelings? And how might your actions have affected others? And then, how might they have felt? What might have caused these feelings for them? How did they express or regulate their feelings? How did their actions affect you or others? So it really just has to do with understanding perspectives when you've done something. Not everything we handle even would involve the blueprint, but the blueprint works well when there was a verbal altercation or verbal conflict and the kids need to really unpack that. It got to a high level in a location where we were able to say, hold on, we might be better off if we could resolve this a different way. And it works really well in scenarios like that. So I'm gonna round out um, our presentation tonight with some of the ideas that came out of our discussions, again, with our leadership team, our faculty, our students that were a part of this conversation. Um, they talked about, you know, when we're in full implementation year two, having uh, at least one or two of these lessons, or even 10 minute, they package it for us. We have resources that are prepared from Ruler for us, where um, you can do a 10 minute activity or discussion with your class, even if it's once a month. Multiply that times all of their classes throughout the day, and kids would get more experiences with these. It doesn't need to be done every day. It doesn't need to be done every week. But even if you did this once a month, or you were committed to talking to your classes about how they're feeling, uh, as a teacher, you're going to recognize when somebody's not in a good place. Who should be included? Right now, we're working on an implementation with grades 6 through 12. Ideally, it'll be K through 12, and I do believe they're drafting plans um, for K through 5. But even our uh, middle school counterparts are working with uh, their school right now in implementing ruler strategies. That would really be an amazing place because all of the language would be reflexive. Understanding what it is and why was, was more about what um, we're working on this year in general with everyone. And this goes down to every adult who comes into, who interacts with the child in this building. So that means our security aides, that means our hall monitors, that means our lunch servers and lunch aides, of course our classroom teachers, of course our PPS staff, anyone who comes into contact should be trained on this before we get too far ahead. Tonight we're hosting a ruler overview presentation for you guys and keeping the lines of communication open about ruler. There's a link on our webpage, on the high school webpage for this information as well. Next year in October or so we'll begin classroom implementation at a widespread and more consistent way. Right now it's really up to teachers in part because of what everyone's going through right now. People are really exhausted and I'm sure you've heard that um, with, it, with dealing with COVID and protocols and everything else. Um, around cancellations and rethinking everything that we've done in school. So it'll be much smoother to implement when you have more control over your plans. And then regular communication from the school to our households about ruler and um, more frequent, um, more, more procedural uh, grade level assemblies. So we would probably have a grade level assembly to start for grades 9 through 12 once next year for about an hour, 45 minutes. That would be the next step for next year. Uh, we've done uh, lessons with, with grades and grade levels and classes this year. And most students, if not all, are pretty familiar with the mood meter uh, in general. And then the, the ruler tool take tens are just 10 minute exercises, 10 minute activities that anyone can run with um, in their classes. And then some student led and SEL conversation starters to take home is part of next year, phase two. These are some uh, strategies, some takeaways, some summative things that come out of the uh, text by Mark Brackett. Um, good for anyone in general, breathing mindfully, practicing self-care, staying connected and surrounding your people, surrounding yourself with people who are calming or, or positive, monitoring your own self-talk um, and, and reframing things to a positive sense when you're talking in your head, uh, having a routine and trying to be productive through that routine, um, Enjoying yourself and taking time for leisure and enjoying the things that you have fun with. And finally, having self and other compassion, being compassionate and, and understanding and forgiving of folks around you, empathetic towards things that are happening in our world, and there's far too much right now. So I'm sure you can take your pick on what you would embark on right now, but um, it's a really good practice in general for putting, your, putting yourself in a good mental place. I want to thank my colleagues, Mr. Herman and Mrs. Martinez, um, 
for, for joining me in this work over the last year and a half or so. Uh, we've really been committed, and most importantly, because our students uh, were going to be in a difficult place through all that they were going through the last two years. So um, I want to thank some of those students that were a part of implementing this. Mr. Hughes is here, and he's on our leadership team, so thank you, Mr. Hughes. And of course, our PTA, who we're hoping um, to do more of this work with and, and talk to you guys about conversation starters to uh, work with your children on at home and just start with asking kids, how, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? And really stopping to listen um, goes a long way. And I'm learning to do that myself. So thanks again for tuning in tonight for our presentation on um, Ruler and uh, look for more of this going forward as we go into year two implementation. Our faculty will be too, and you'll hear more about this at home and on our website, but we'll keep you informed, keep that line of communication open. Have a great night, guys, and don't, don't sign off because there, there is another presentation from Mr. Hungerford in, uh, regarding attendance. Mr. Hungerford, are you here? All right, come on in. Mr. Hungerford is here. He's got a presentation for you guys, a few words on uh, attendance. And this is a K-12 message, I believe. So, without further ado, Mr. Hungerford. Hi guys, how are you? I don't have anything as, as, uh, as uh, this is very uh, impressive work by Dr. Tom. I don't have anything like that to show you. Uh, I just want to try to make, make my way around over the next few months, maybe through the end of this year, beginning of next year, to talk to different PTA units and different buildings about uh, regarding attendance. And I know we've all been dealing with the pandemic and the effects of the pandemic in schools, and it's obviously had an effect on attendance in all our buildings and all our levels. And the state of New York, when we had the last year, they were changing how they wanted to attendance recorded and what were certain absences. And I think all the employees who work with me, the, the, the secretaries, the attendance recorders, and all the buildings did a really good job. The teachers did a great job. We're constantly shifting gears on what was considered to be, you know, how we're counting attendance, how it's being recorded. The state did change their mind several times. And I know people at home were more frustrated and parents are frustrated with certain things and dealing with issues about, do I send my kids to school? What do I do? What, what whole thing? And hopefully we'll all put that in the big rear view mirror now and head back to regular school, you know, school how as it was before March 13th of, uh, of 2020, right? So what I, what I want to talk very briefly about is, is chronic absenteeism. Right? Basically, chronic absenteeism is listed as uh, a student who misses more than 10% of school for any given reason in a school year. So if we take 183 days, which is our school year calendar, and that's why we have a, 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 an eye-popping presentation because it's very directly really simple. If, it's, if you miss 10% of 183 days, and at the secondary level, we all know not all 183 days are pure instruction days. There's exam days and things like that mixed in. You're talking about missing 18 days of school or, or 18 days, no, 18.3, point third of the day. Let's make it 19, missing 19 days of school in the school year. And when you look at it from a year perspective and you say, wow, that's 19 days sounds like a lot of days to miss, but it can slowly add up on kids because we're going to school for 10 months and you miss one day for a couple months and all of a sudden you do two days or you actually get legitimately sick and you're out of school for a period of time with bronchitis or an illness, it can kind of add up quick. And I think what parents have to be aware of is that, you know, attendance is, is habit forming. It's life habit forming. I hear kids will say all the time, before I was attend school stuff, I was a dean for many years, and we talked about kids going to class, and I would say to them, well, you have the job, do you go to work all the time? And they go, sure, I get paid. Of course I'm gonna go to work. That's the obvious common answer that we always hear, right? But the reality of it is, when we say, well, school is your, it's, you're being paid in school to a degree, but most kids in the high school age group do not work every day. They don't work after school every day. They work on Tuesday, they work on Friday. I had two students who were in that age group not too long ago. You know, Ms. Martinez has students in that age group, right, they work. They work part-time hours, right? They work on Tuesday, they work on Friday. So their jobs are not every day, like ours become when we become adults, right? So for them to, to not want to miss work because they're getting paid is easy. Well, I go on Tuesday and I'll see you on Friday and I'll work Saturday and I'll do half a shift on, on Sunday morning, it's really easy. But, but these are all habits that are forming 
that they're going to take with them when they leave high school, whether they go to the world of work, go to college, whatever they do, there'll be the habits of saying that, ah, I just really, I just need a day off, I just really want to go today. Okay, it's okay, I don't want to fight the fight, stay home today. And, and I just think of the things that as we come out of the pandemic and head back to a normal school, as, as parents and as people in the community, we have to fight that fight because we have to create the habits of what is every day. Eventually, the job is going to be every day. Everything you do is going to be every day. So, of course, you don't want to miss when you work 18 hours a week or three days. That's easy. But now, all of a sudden, when you're doing something every day, habit forming, like school is, you just got to get up and go every day you can and not, and not take those days. In, in a high school setting, we're always going to have some more absences from kids doing college visits. There are more legitimate absences that kids take, the students take, than they do in the elementary school. We know that just from, just from those kind of things. But I've noticed over the past several months, uh, people calling and taking and asking liberties for days that we didn't really see prior to this. You know, liberties on you know birthdays and things like that and stuff. And, and those are all great days, but I, I don't, I really don't believe we're missing school for that. You know, and um, and that's, that's why I'm trying to get that message that we got to try to make our kids go to school whenever possible and try to think about what that 10% is all about, right? And parents at home, you don't, you don't need an infinite campus to keep track. You know, we all did this before infinite campus and before technology, and just make a tally line on a piece of paper in your, in your, in your kitchen cabinet, you tack up on the refrigerator, and look, and you've been out, you know, like, you gotta go to school. And uh, it's really, I don't think it's really truly that much to keep track of. And the other thing I wanna mention was we are having a lot of issues with um, parents not calling their kids in. And not, and you know, kids that students that come to school, maybe they all legitimately say, but we don't get a call in the attendance office in any of the buildings, and it remains marked as an EBS. And I think that it puts tremendous pressure on teachers as to why the student wasn't in school, and then when the student comes back to school to ascertain, well, what am I doing with that student that missed? He didn't get called in, it's an ABS, it's not an excuse absence. Well, I'm gonna have to make up the work, and maybe some other teachers, you know, it's. It, it does not, it's not a very clean system. And, and I would implore parents to, if, you, if your son or daughter is home, to call in, call in the attendance office and say they're home sick today. Or you may forget, you may be at work and you may have forgotten that day, but call within a timely fashion, within a day or two. We have a lot of students who have you know, not cleaned up absences, you know, and, and parents do students forget. And I know you have seniors, and people who have seniors, the parents of seniors think, well, they're almost adults, they kind of can take care of themselves. They can't take care of them. And we don't allow a senior to walk in. Well, I was homesick yesterday. We still need to speak to a parent on the phone to come to the body and get, get an answer. And a note will always be followed up on any of the officers in the, in the district with a phone call. So there will be a note and we'll get a phone call for early dismissal or for absences. And, and lastly, early dismissal, especially in high school, there were a lot of kids that do leave early for a variety of reasons, appointments, whatever, driver exam, you know, when you get the driver test, but whenever they tell you to go, you better go, right? So um, it, it, it helps if the student comes into the building in the beginning of the day with a note that they have to start with, and that just makes the process easier because we're able to tell them in the morning, the ladies in my office are in the morning, hey, at this time, come down, at this time, we'll do this and that. Instead of the parent just showing up with a kind of cold cord in the door, and then all of a sudden, depending on what the student has that period, if they have lunch, there's a few different places to can be in the lunch period. Now, you're, now we have people searching the building, looking for students, parents texting students, the whole thing. It would just be cleaned up if in the morning they brought they had a note, they brought to our office, they gave it to, to the ladies in the office, they were to call and get it all kind of kind of squared away. And what are they coming out for the rest of the day? They come back. All those types of things. So, um, you know, as we have, like I said, we move towards back towards what we hope a regular school environment for. Forever again, never to have to go back to where we were. These are just things I'm starting to, I see as, as things that you know, I would like to be addressed and people to understand the importance in, in the scheme of, of getting a child educated properly and being in school every day you can and, and making the most of being here. You know, and we all know that school isn't just about you know, the academics and socialization and being with other people and, and being able to interact and make decisions and talk to people in person. I know we've spent a lot of time on computer screens in the last couple of years, but I think we will be happy to be here. And the more you can get your kids to come here and not be home, the better off it is. And we all know kids, they do get, they do get a listen, they have to be out for a period of time. And, and I think one thing that came out of the pandemic was the ability for us to educate students when they're homesick better than ever before. I think that's a really, I think that's a really good thing. And we can send, send home or make a correspondence with some of the points of the internet. Excellent. About 10%, about, yeah. about, 10 about, uh, sure. about early dismissal and 
about notes. We can, we can summarize some of the Great. Right. I appreciate that. Right. Right. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. the words about it and talk about it. It's just kind of important. I'll try to get some other buildings and talk to them as well. And uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. All right. See yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's easier for kids to give it like the time. Right. 